By design, I am a creative conservationist. Creativity is my way of comprehending, challenging, and countering the current realities of this world, our world, a world that is both human and wild. Art empowers me to act in this world. So I art as I act, and I act as I art. By design, I'm also a deeply emotional creature. And when I was younger, I didn't know how to own this. I was taught that emotions are a weakness you'd had to overcome. So I believed my mother when she told me that I was more of an, uh, a liability than an asset to the conservation movement due to my lack of emotional objectivity. So I wound up pursuing a path that took me into fashion. And I actually you know, was successful at that because it took me away from the pain and the tears. And I was engaged by this field, but I never felt whole. And the reason why it was because you can't really hide from hurt. It finds you. Four years ago, I lost my father to cancer. Now, no life experience could have prepared me for this. It was a huge loss, and I was devastated by it. And just as I was beginning to piece myself together and make sense of the world that I was in, which did not include him anymore, the BP oil spill happened. And I remember reading articles and seeing news clips about the dead dolphins that were washing up along the shorelines, caked in crude, and the pelicans that were soaked in the slick, gasping for their last breath. And I remember thinking to myself, this feels like the same loss that I felt when I was by my dad's deathbed. And I was transported right back to that moment where I saw his heartline flatline in the ICU. To me, every single wild being that is lost is like losing family. It feels through and through in every cell in my body, which is why I do what I do, because I care. And I start, stopped thinking, you know, why isn't someone doing something about this? And started thinking, well, I'm someone, and I'm doing absolutely nothing about it. So I decided to take ownership of my pain and who I was, just as I was. And I decided to channel my inner mosquito. Now, for those of you who think an individual cannot make a difference, look to the mosquito. Every time that sucker lands a bite, he has impact. Channel your inner mosquito. I urge you to do this. And so I began creating works, mostly because the pain was so overwhelming, it just exploded onto paper. And the works were really a way for me to explain what was happening in the world around me to myself, because I needed to see it to be able to understand it, and so I could explain it to yet another person. So I began creating really simple artwork, things that were two-dimensional, silhouette-focused, and used the fewest number of colors possible, because I wanted anyone who saw it to be able to understand the core of the issue with a single glimpse. So I began creating works that would contrast positive space with negative space, so people could see what we had left behind while we understood what was lost forever. And I began showing pieces that would help evoke a sense of earth stewardship, evoke a sense of responsibility in others, and connect them to the wild the way I felt connected to the wild, so they too would feel the loss that I felt when wild was destroyed. And so I started contrasting nature's design with anthropocentric design, creating works that would show our chokehold on all that was magical and wondrous about this world, like plastics. And I began realizing that there was this clear way in which consumer choices were impacting the world around me. We're losing wildlife not because of chronic conditions or diseases, like my father's death to cancer. It's because of consumer choices, something that we actively participate in with every single daily choice we make. And so we vote with our wallets. And so I decided to start creating products that would help people tie into the larger picture effortlessly, just by buying into it from cell phone cases to t-shirts, and then using post-consumer waste to cultivate a dialogue about how holding this object in your hand, a simple thing as a milk carton, could actually have ripples globally and impact wildlife around you. And so I started this campaign, which is about missing, sort of like the missing persons from 1930s, but missing species in this day and age. And the PET bottle campaign, which you see all around me, which is called Message in a Bottle, 
which upcycles PET bottles beyond its intended design, which was just to serve as a vessel to carry portable water. Now it carries conservation messages from various voices from around the world, empowering us with a visual petition to show that so many people have come together to take a strong stand for the world around us, for all of us. And so I started creating works that would help people think outside of the box. Because when you allow for a bottle to be more than it was intended to be, you allow people to break out of the current design. Because every single problem that is prevalent in our times is emergent from flawed design. And I figured what better way to address issues, in, issues emerging from and orbiting bad design than by design. Bad design is unresolved, it's open-ended, it results in chain reactions, not closed loops. Bad design has side effects like pollution, waste, loss, death. And so I wanted to create works that would help us connect these issues in design through design. Because design is the one thing that can constantly evolve just like us. And it can stand for change. Because in the end, it's about mobilizing the youth and getting people who are young early on to see this as part of their life effortlessly that conservation is not something separate from them, but an extension of exactly who they are. Because the wild is really within us. And for me, it's a matter of evoking the truths of our time at a pace that's congruous to the learning curve of the viewers. So I show things at, at a pace that would be assimilated by them at the time that they want to take it in. And so, since I do tell the stories of the age of man, I've started saying it in places most frequented by man. One such place is, of course, New York's Times Square. And so I created this billboard in partnership with March for Elephants and Loud Sauce. It ran for a month long, and it ran 24-7, four times an hour. And Times Square receives over 350,000 people a day. So over the course of the month that this campaign ran, we had 1.5 million people looking at it. So that's a story that got across to 1.5 million eyes and minds. Consumer market. I'd like to play the spot for you now. So you hear them hacking into the elephant's faces, trying to extract the tusks. And the reason why you hear the groans and moans towards the end of the video is because they're still conscious and alive for this. So the pain they feel is the pain I feel in those moments. And the loss is palpable. So the, the, the name Blood Ivory is aptly denoted to the trade. I tell the same stories in as many ways possible, as possible in as, many way, in as many media outlets as possible. So this story is actually again about the Blood Ivory and Blood Horn, but when you reiterate, it allows for the consumer mindscape to really register what you're trying to tell them. So we said it on mass transport systems and on consumer magazines. These four campaigns were run in partnership with Wild Aid. But it's not just about educating the public about the problem at hand, it's also about showing them that the perspective that they harbor right now needs to flip. It's about letting them connect from what they know to what they don't know and have an emotional response to what is there. So this campaign was run to educate the Chinese market because they take great pride in the conservation success they've achieved with pandas in China. I wanted them to extend the same empathy for African wildlife, hence the pandas of Africa. And I wanted to also help people on the, on the ground, on the field, because they're on the front lines, it's the other end of that same spectrum, and really empower the communities that are stepping up for the collective in a really brave way by putting their lives at risk. And this particular field initiative that you see about is, is organized by Sabo Pride, and it's called um, Operation Linda Wanyama. They largely recruited Maasai warriors who take great pride in their heritage, their warrior clan. So I rebranded them and gave them an official purpose by reinterpreting the Maasai shield onto a horizontal, on a, onto a horizontal axis, creating a custodian eye that would watch over the wildlife in their own backyard. Because in the end, no matter how much we try to separate ourselves from the wild around us, the wild is all around, and it's inescapable. It is why animal prints never go out of fashion, and it's why 
Katy Perry's song, Roar, is so popular. And I think in trying to separate ourselves, we only found ways to further connect to the wild. Because the wild within is desperately trying to find a way to connect to the wild beyond. So I would like to leave you with the following questions. If this were your last, and you had the choice to design a better future that is more inclusive and accounts for the collective, why don't you? And given that you are each, by design, as unique as your fingerprints, and the design that you choose today as your lifestyle and as your life imprint on the planet around you, if it is your choice, then choose wisely. Be aware of it and own it. Empower yourselves in the choice that you make today because you have from today until your last breath to have impact on the whole world, on the world that you live in, that others that you love live in as well. Thank you.